What's good, Human Geo? So, uh, it is Friday, September the 11th, or, uh, the 19th anniversary uh, of a very fateful day in, a, in American history. Um, so, we, we take pause to remember that and, and the sacrifice that, that many made. Uh, it's, a, it's an important day in our, in our country's history, especially when you look at modern history in the 21st century for, for us uh, as a nation. All right, let's get into um, continuing chapter one. Goal is Monday, we, we want to be able to wrap up fully chapter one lecture so that then we can get ourselves ready for Tuesday and, and Wednesday. Tuesday, you have a vocab quiz, then it's just complete study time for you. Wednesday is your chapter one test. There are things that you need to know. So on Schoology, you see you've got your reading guide due and then vocab quiz. There is a primer quiz. This primer quiz is a practice for the real test on Wednesday. We are taking questions from our test bank. Many of them were lifting ver verbatim from your actual test on Wednesday. So we ask that you take this. If you score a 70% or higher, you get full credit for the assignment. Anything below 70%, then you get that score. So if you score 40%, you get four out of 10. It's a 10 point assignment. The reason, and you can take it as many times as you want. You can take it 20 times if either it's for studying purposes or to get to that 70% that threshold. Again, we feel it's beneficial because you're looking at questions in the fashion that they're going to be on Wednesday. So that's there for you. In the chapter one folder later today on Friday, you, you will see your review guide for the chapter one test. That'll be available for you. That breaks down every multiple choice question, its topic. So study it, do whatever you want. You can share it with one another, work on it together. I don't care. It's not an assignment per se. It's just to let you, again, give you another mechanism in which you can study. All right, let's get to let's get to um, some more notes. I want to keep this at 10 minutes or less, and then Monday we'll be ready to roll. All right, bell one, you are a little bit ahead of this. Bell two, this is where we ended. Now we're looking at differences when you when you compare space. We're not talking about outer, we're talking about here physical space that we as humans inhabit uh, here on Earth. Um, some cities, we said how they were they were laid out pretty well. Um, cities can also sort of be laid out based on their ethnicity. And so that's not a, a determined thing in many cases. It usually just happens sort of over time. Um, but you see as populations move in because economic opportunity, education, we've seen ethnic groups sort of populate certain regions in particular cities. You're looking at an aerial view of Chicago. This is the ethnic breakdown of Chicago. And so you're looking at white people usually inhabiting the north side. Those are your Cubby fans, all right, if you're a baseball person. And then you can see some light red as we get into the suburbs, predominate, predominantly white people living there. African-Americans constituting the South, South side. So those are White Sox fans. And then the more interior inside the loop, getting closer to inside the loop of Chicago. And then you have Hispanic populations as well. You can see um, lower socioeconomic in many cases are inhabiting the interior of the city. Um, even though it's expensive to live in some parts, uh, very expensive to live in Chicago, there are some parts that it is more affordable for those people. Let me present it. I think that'll be better. There you go. Uh, distribution by sexual orientation. Your book kind of looks at this where, where do we see um, large populations of homosexuals in, in, in the United States? You're seeing on the coasts and then also large contingent in Florida. Um, Key West famously has a, has a large um, um, gay population as well. But again, that's something where if the climate is more conducive to being accepting of people who are of a different, different sexual orientation, they're more likely to want to go there because they're going to be treated more fairly um, because people are going to, you know, the, the judgment is not going to be passed on them. You're not likely to see that in more conservative areas. And so the South being more conservative, it could be more difficult for someone to live there. So if they can, they perhaps choose not to live in those areas. We see in other parts of the world, there are harsh penalties in some cases if you are deemed to be or engaging in homosexual activity. And so for those people, if they can leave the country, good, I guess, you know, you, you, you want them to feel like they, they, they are treated as a, a, a human, um, but in some cases they're not able to leave and they, they face, unfortunately, oppression in those areas. Again, those are just terms. Take them down. All right, look at them. Um, you, you've got the vocab down. All right, I don't want to spend time just on that one slide. Internet access. Um, so we, we, what we see uh, is um, 
there is continuing to be a growing despair between your developed states, so countries like the US, most of Europe, and our developing regions of the world, states in Asia, states in parts of South America, um, states in Africa as well. And a lot of that could be tied to access to the internet. You have access to the internet, that is just going to help speed that transition to becoming a more developed place. Um, if you don't, just think of the things you're unable to do with the internet. Now, I'm not saying it's the end all be all, and it's not the only metric that we're looking at, but our banking system is completely tied to virtual transactions these days. If your country can't do that, you not only are maybe in, inhibiting your people, but you're also inhibiting your country as a whole to be able to engage on the, on the world scene in some instances. So having more widespread, widespread broadband access for your people is a benefit and usually means a sign of higher economic development. We see, even though in a country like the United States, we're one of the wealthiest, all right, per capita, we're in the top 10 for sure. We see a lot of people that don't have access to the internet, don't we? Where? In parts of Appalachia, rural areas, and that leads to uneven development even here in the United States. People are lacking when it comes to wealth, and sometimes it's because they lack getting access to a lot of the things many of us take for granted, which internet would be one of them, right? Remember Bernie, Bernie always talks about that talks about the one percent this that and the other i don't do a good bernie impression but whether or not you like bernie sanders it's not about that he raises the idea of inequality when it comes to things such as internet access um quite often in his platform all right 23 dollars i think that's what he says right 23 dollars um education inequality map the united states what is the smartest state in our union that would be colorado when you look at we're not, we're, we're looking at people that have at least a bachelor's degree or higher in terms of their educational achievement. And then you can see, and we're looking at mustard colors here, uh, the yellow mustard states, Arkansas, Mississippi, West Virginia as well. Uh, Ohio, I don't, what are we? Like a Dijon mustard, I guess you would say. Um, so we're right in the middle, about 30 some odd percent of our population has at least a bachelor's degree of our adult population. but. Colorado is, is tiptoeing above 40% of their population does, of their adult population. So doesn't mean they're better. Mm, that's up to you to decide. But it does show that for them, education, uh, there many of their people are able to achieve a pretty high level of education. Fusion, when we talk about culture, we want to know where it starts, if we can, when it starts, and who is impacted. And so we want to look for hearths. You know, where does a language begin? Where does a religion begin, all right? When does a, a, a new viral social media video or, or, or dance, if you will, on TikTok, when does, that, when does that start? Where does it start? And so that's a hearth. And so that's what that means with that. Diffusion is the spread across space. Relocation diffusion is physically moving of people, spreading ideas, spreading perhaps their elements of culture. The best example, why do we speak English in the United States? Because the British, the British controlled almost the entire world in the 17, 18 and early 1900s. They colonized where we live today. And so we speak English. It's weird to think that had we been, you know, had this area been colonized by a different group of people, or if it had remained indigenous, our language would be most likely different today that we speak as a general population. So why do people speak Spanish? in places that are not Spain, or French in parts of Canada. It's because of colonization, imperialization. That's relocation diffusion. There's Spain as a, Spanish as a primary language. Um, hierarchical diffusion, it's the spreading from persons of authority. So if you look at companies, they are a good example of that. You have your executive at the very top. Um, so you're looking at Ford Motor Company here. We could, we could put up Procter & Gamble, we could put up Tesla, we could put up Google, Apple, Amazon, whatever it is. They have a diffusion down of power. So while the president and CEO has a great deal of power, the executive chairman, the head of their board is the most powerful person for the Ford Motor Company. Now, they've got presidents of their North American operation, their European operation, their Chinese operation, everywhere. Those people, good deal of power looking over the United States, but they still have to answer at the end of the day to the people at the highest. It's very similar to a monarchy, right? In a monarchy, king, queen, they have the most power, usually the king, male dominated, 
And so those that are under, you know, that are in the bloodline but below have to answer, of course, and are subservient to the king. Again, there you go, hierarchy. We think of, I think of the Catholic Church, Catholic Church hierarchy, the clergy. Contagious diffusion spread like a wave. Um, this would be example would be your viral videos or TikTok. When something goes viral on TikTok, it is it's like wildfire. It's it's spreading and you can't stop it. Go back a few years ago, dating myself here, but Tebowing was a big thing for a while. And that was because of the football player, Tim Tebow. That's just Cam Newton flossing. Not the real floss, though. You know, there you go. Take you back to middle school, people. Right. That's still a thing, flossing. I don't think so. But Tim Tebow, incredibly devout individual, was a football player at the University of Florida. And then for the Denver Broncos, he was a quarterback. Um, when he would score a touchdown or a big moment would happen, he would pause and genuflect, all right, based on his faith, so saying a prayer, or he's giving, you know, he's giving thanks to God. And so people from around, you know, the, the country were T-bowing as in, as in respect. A lot of times it was Denver Broncos fans, but again, it was, you know, viral at the time. And we had the Ice Bucket Challenge a few years ago, ALS Ice Bucket Challenge. Stimulus diffusion. It's the spread of a principle, but it, it, it fa the whole characteristic itself fails to diffuse. So think about people who try to copy what Apple did with their, with their iPhone. Um, you know, you've got, of course, um, the Samsung Galaxy, you have Google's Pixel, and they're good in their own ways. In some cases, they're copying what Apple does, and they're maybe not able to do it as well. You know, they can't exactly be the iPhone. But then there's other things that the, you know, the Galaxy does that I, I would argue the, you know, the iPhone doesn't do as well. But that's a, a, a good example that we're seeing. So copycats when it comes to technology is an easy example there. All right, section four, it's all about sustainability. Let's get through it because I want to show you a, a really cool video on Monday. So when it comes to resources, you have renewable versus non-renewable resources. If it's renewable, you can use it again. If it's non, it's gone. So once you start your engine, you are using an unleaded fuel tank or a diesel fuel tank in your car. You fire it up. You start burning that gasoline or that diesel, that petroleum is gone. You never get it again. Okay. And it's usually, of course, leaving something behind, which in this case would be a type of pollution. Renewable energy sources can be used again. We're talking wind, solar, in some cases, hydro uh, as well. When it comes to sustainability, there's three pillars, a focus on the environment, folks focus on the economic and a focus on society as well. I'm a big person on recycling. I know I get made fun of, but it's simple. I don't see why it's that hard to do. Whether if it helps or not, I, I would I would argue that there is a benefit to it when you look at plastic in this world. But you know what? Call me crazy. Call me crazy. All right, pillar one, environmental. You have conservation versus preservation. For conservation, you want to conserve less. So I want to conserve water. I don't want to be pumping it out everywhere. I want to try to use less. I set a timer on my shower to take a five minute shower because I don't want to be wasting water. That's conservation. Preservation is you're trying to protect something. So we, you know, you've got people who are advocating that we shouldn't be drilling in, in certain habitats or drilling in the Arctic for oil or cutting down forests. They want to preserve those areas because they think it's for nature and it's not just for humans to take use in whatever they whatever way they see fit. Last year, I guess Hurricane Dorian was going on. I don't know. Who knows. I'm fascinated by weather, though, man. I love I love aerial aerial um, photos of of hurricanes and such like that. I should have been a meteorologist. Good. Here's today's weather. It is sunny outside. Number two, economic. You look at a resource's price, and it's usually dependent on how much we use it and how easy it is to access it. So right now, gasoline. I think I was driving past the speedway on my way to Clough today. I think gasoline was right at a dollar eighty-eight for the lowest grade for a gallon. It's pretty cheap. Diesel was around two twenty uh, for a gallon. Um, that's because it's while it takes effort in this country, we try to keep taxes low on gasoline because again, people need it. They need it for transportation, get to work, recreation, and so we don't want to punish people because it's such a widely used source. If we wanted to make a big move away from gasoline if the government began taxing it at a level which raises the price perhaps that would dissuade people from using it but if you see gasoline prices that are low I, it's you know if you're really driven to support the environment you'll make that change for you know to a hybrid or even an electric it's going to cost you money of course you know to do that but then the it pays off down the road but if not 
you're going to continue filling up with, you know, with gasoline. There you go. There you go. That's Carmageddon in Los Angeles. That's it. most everyday traffic for them, but maybe not as not as much during COVID. And then society, that means that our values end up impacting what we choose to purchase or do as consumers. It, it, it makes us, you know, think differently when we're when we're looking at uh, when we buy something. You know, do we want something that is organic? Do we want something that is from local local sur- suppliers? That is based on our values. And so that impacts our consumer choices and producers wanna know this, right? You look at the organic section in Kroger six years ago, itty bitty, really small. You look at it today, it's basically part of what is just your conventional produce. Same thing with buying local. You see little buy local tags all across Kroger now when you're going to the grocery store and it used to be a really niche thing. And You usually had to pay more for those. And now we're seeing that their prices are competitive with conventional suppliers. And so maybe people will be more willing, even if it's only, you know, maybe it's a couple of cents more or maybe it's a dollar more. They'd be willing to to buy something that's local or something that's organic versus conventional. It just depends on how our choice goes to get through. I got a story on Monday. Remind me to tell you. Remind me. It's about Kroger. There's an urban myth, an urban legend about Kroger in Hyde Park, the Hyde Park Plaza Kroger. Have me tell you about it on Monday. I got to tell you in person, I can't tell you now. No. Air pollution, China, bad air. Yeah, we get it. Not good, not good, not good here either. Um, when you look at animals, um, you know, the World Wildlife Fund says that climate change is, is wreaking havoc on, on animal populations and ecosystems. And so they say it's too late to do anything about it. They're saying that we, we've kind of made our bed, chip has sailed. There are others though that are more optimistic and say that we, we we're running out of time, but we have the ability to make changes that could have severe impacts in a positive way um, for, for our world. Rest in peace, Harambe. And this is where I'll stop. You look at your, you look at earth and our physical systems. You either have a biotic system or abiotic systems when it comes to life on this planet. Living organisms constitute the biotic realm. Abiotics um, are non-living matter. That is that is part of our ecosystem. There are four physical systems, atmosphere at the top, hydrosphere, water, and lithosphere, which would be our ground level, the biosphere, plants, animals, things that are that are on, that are that are part uh, of our of our of our lithosphere. And that's really it. I don't want to go into too much about you you kind of get those. So there you go. We have different climates. Hydrosphere, Earth is 97% water. How do we get fresh water? We get it from precipitation coming from the sky. Lithosphere, we've got our levels of Earth's crust. All right, core, the mantle, which is the molten interior. Most plants and animals live in this litho. Not they do, but they live in places that are flat or at least have access to vegetation or access to water. It makes sense. They don't want to be living somewhere where they can't eat they can't drink. All plants and animals, even microorganisms, live in the biosphere, make up the biosphere. And there you go. We'll stop here. We'll pick up with Monday and finish that up. All right, everyone. I hope you have a very, very good weekend. Um, please take care of yourself. Look out for one another. Um, reminders, please keep checking Schoology. You see our due dates. If you've got any questions uh, for what's upcoming this week, by all means, please don't hesitate to contact me. Otherwise, be safe, Spartans. Take care of one another. Uh, I will see you on Monday. Ciao.